Good evening and welcome to the seventh presentation of Avalanche Cabinets webinar series. First off, I'd like to thank all our sponsors for their financial support during these challenging economic times and working with us to reach out to new backcountry users this year. If it wasn't with them, we wouldn't be able to put on these programs. A few housekeeping notes, folks. Uh, everyone comes in automatically muted. Um, there will be opportunities to ask questions. To do so, you just click on the raised hand button in your dashboard. Um, we'll lean on you, uh, pick you out of the box there, and then uh, allow you to do verbal questions. Uh, another way to ask questions is to type them in the question chat box, which is also on the GoTo dashboard there, just below uh, the top of your dashboard screen there. Today's presentation is going to be choosing train for snowmobilers. Train choice is always the answer to having a safe, fun day out in the backcountry. We're going to review some avalanche train basics and then lead into you through a few variety of images and exercises that are going to help you hone up on these skills, we hope. Your presenter today is Martina Halick. Martina has worked in the avalanche industry for 15 years as a ski patroller, a ski guide, and has been with Avalanche Canada since 2013. She's currently the lead avalanche technician for Avalanche Canada's North Rockies field team. So there's going to be a Q&A at the end of the program and possibly throughout this presentation. So I'm going to pass along to Martina now. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. Hey, Brad, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm just going to get my uh, presentation loaded up here. Um, and I'm not sure right now, just practice this and it's not working. <laughs> doesn't want to go in full screen mode doesn't, there for you? It doesn't want to, um, <laughs> sorry, it doesn't want to give me the, uh, the selection. Huh. Yeah, maybe you can, can you start it for me, Brent? No, I can't actually. Mm -hmm. Can you just uh, go out, go to your first slide? It looks like you're on your second slide there for starters. Yep. Oh, okay. I am sharing my screen. This is working for you guys. No, I don't see it yet. So now we're on there. the first slide and you're in working mode. Can you go? Perfect. There we go. Okay, that's um, what I want to be. <laughs> so it's don't um, uh, Okay, I'm going right. this straight here. There we go. Awesome. Golden. Yay. <laughs> Success. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to um, start everything off here. Um, just gauge who my who my audience is um, and get an idea of everybody's experience level. So we're going to start with a quick poll. Um, and if you can, um, you know, just reach forward, click, let me know, you know, if you're AST1, AST2, maybe you've had um, CAA training, um, we'll just get that, get that going. Oh, let's see, we've got some votes coming in. Give that a bit more time. Oh, okay. Well, so far it's looking like we have a bunch of AST ones. Thirty-six percent of you, um, twenty-six percent um, have kind of a little bit. Twenty-three percent none, and we've even got um, eight percent AST two and eight percent CA level training. So um, a good mix. Um, let me just click through here again. Awesome. Okay. So um, just to, to start off, it might be a bit of review for some of you, but I just wanted to go through some, some avalanche train basics. Um, I think it's just always good to, to go back to just to the basics to, to begin with, right? Um, things like like the avalanche hazard triangle, you know? Um, what what can we control out of this? I mean, we're, we're putting ourselves into the terrain, so we have a bit of control 
over us. Um, we can't control the unstable snow and the weather that creates it. So really, um, what we can create is where we put, or what we can control is where we put ourselves in that terrain. Um, so that's really what we're going to focus on today. Um, one of the keys uh, for me, I think, is just really knowing your slope angle and, and getting good at, at, um, at guessing that slope angle kind of right off. And uh, it, it takes a bit of time to, to be able to just eyeball a slope and say that is 36 degrees or that's 28, that sort of thing. So um, I recommend if you don't have an inclinometer, you know, you can do it with a compass, you can just get an app on your phone. Um, but really, really learn to recognize those those key um, slope angles uh, between 30 and 45 degrees. That's where most of your avalanches occur. Um, you know, below 30 degrees, gravity often doesn't have enough of an effect. I mean, it, there, there are exceptions to this. Um, sometimes, you know, you can you can be in a run out zone, that sort of thing. But really, where, where avalanches initiate are, are in that 30 to 45. And, you know, steeper than 45, things tend to slough off. You're not as likely to get um, dangerous slab avalanches, um, that sort of thing. So really, really learning your, your slope angles. Um, and then, you know, where are you most likely to, to trigger an avalanche? Um, and usually what you're doing is you're, you're initiating an, an avalanche over convexity. Um, and that's, that's this slide here on the right. I'm hoping you guys can see my cur cursor. But um, basically, if you picture, I always like to use the analogy of, of a Mars bar or a Snickers bar or something. And if you grab that and then you just start to, to kind of bend it, um, where those cracks appear, you know, um, if, you, if you bend it in this way, it's kind of supported, right? That's going to be your, your concavity um, as opposed to the convexity. So um, kind of as you're riding through terrain, also being aware of, even if you're on micro features, where you're most likely to, to trigger an avalanche from. And then, you know, a quick word on terrain traps as well. Um, so terrain traps are anything that increase the risk or danger um, if an avalanche is pushes you, if an avalanche pushes you into or through them, right? So creeks, um, holes like gullies, uh, cut banks, uh, trees, cliffs, anything like that. Um, so it, it's, oh, we just exited by accident there. I'm not sure how that happened. I'll just restart it back where we were. Okay. We've got it back. Um, <clears throat> so while I'm riding around, um, even again, if I'm on small pieces of terrain, um, I'm always looking at what the consequences are. And we kind of do that as riders, as sledders anyway, right? You don't necessarily want to commit to a big side hill if, <laughs> if you feel like you might lose it and, and go off of a cliff or that sort of thing. We're always thinking about the consequences. Am I going to get stuck? Am I not? So this is kind of one more feature. Rather than just thinking about our riding ability, it's also what happens if this slope slides? Um, am I going to get swept into trees, off a cliff, that sort of thing? So um, kind of thinking about that as you're riding along. And I just want to go through um, some of the, the avalanche terrain exposure scale here. Um, so Starting off with simple terrain, you know, this is where many options exist to reduce or avoid your avalanche hazard exposure. Um, there's mostly low angle forested terrain, some forest openings might exist, right? Um, you, there might be exposure to run out zones. Um, but there's no glacier travel, it's pretty straightforward, um, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> I'm just going to flip through my notes here. And, you know, if you're if you're joining us and you're one of those people that's um, kind of a, at the, you know, just beginning your avalanche education or, or maybe, you know, all the way up to AST1 level, you know, this might just be simple terrain, might just be where you want to hang out for a while until you've, 
gathered a bunch more information um, and, and expanded your education. I mean, for me, I know I, I have a lot of fun in simple terrain. Um, and that's kind of something that we have over skiers. Usually as skiers, we need a bit more of a slope in order to, to have fun. But as sledders, I mean, we can have a ton of fun even in non-avalanche terrain. Um, and in simple terrain, we can find all sorts of features to hop off of, um, practice practice skills, I mean, playing around in the trees. Um, I often, I feel like I have a lot more fun just playing around in the, in the trees in simple terrain than I do hill climbing or, or that sort of thing a lot of the time. So kind of keep that in mind too when you're, when you're choosing your terrain. Um, you don't necessarily have to expose yourself to a bunch of avalanche hazards in order to have fun out there. Um, challenging terrain, stepping it up a little bit. So here we would have exposure to well-defined avalanche paths, start zones. Um, you can kind of see in this photo where the avalanche paths are. And you know, if you wanted to minimize your exposure, um, it would be tricky on a sled. But you know, if you're better than me, you could pick your way through the trees, that sort of thing. Um, requires advanced skills to avoid avalanche hazard. Um, but there are options to reduce your risk. Um, <clears throat> and glacier travel is straightforward. Uh, we're not going to get too much into glacier travel for for this presentation, but and then and then we have complex terrain. Um, and as you can see from this photo, I kind of uh, picked this terrain because there's a whole bunch of natural avalanches that have come down here, and you can see there's minimal, pretty much no chance to um, avoid exposure to, to avalanche hazard here, right? So you're just kind of in it. <laughs> um, so if you're getting into complex terrain, you want to be pretty certain about your conditions, about your decision making. It might be a little bit of kind of threading the needle to find your safe areas. Um, so we have multiple avalanche start zones, potential for terrain traps below. Um, and and I, I feel like complex terrain requires a strong group. Um, with years of critical decision-making skills. I remember when I was first starting out in the avalanche industry, I didn't really venture out into complex terrain for the first couple of years, um, unless I was with you know, a really strong leader that was kind of making those decisions for me. Um, <clears throat> now, in order to find out you know, ahead of time, say you're going into a new area, you're planning to, um, you might want to gather some information on what type of terrain it's going to be, right? Whether you're going to be heading into simple, challenging, or complex terrain. And so Avalanche Canada has mapped many of the main riding areas. Um, and they're just they're another tool um, for you in order to evaluate, um, do your risk assessment, plan ahead of time. And they're just kind of intended as a guide for the potential severity of avalanche hazards in the area. They're not 100% accurate. They don't show micro terrain. You're still going to have to do a bunch of um, analysis when you're down, you know, down on the ground, staring at the terrain around you. But it helps you make a decision before you've headed out into into the terrain. Now, um, to access that, you just go to Avalanche Canada um, under the Backcountry Resources tab and and click on Trip Planner. And it's just a great tool too if you if you wanted to head into an area, a whole bulletin region you've never been to before, like the Caribous or maybe the South Rockies. Um, it just shows you a bunch like where the popular riding areas are um, and and places you might want to check out. So it's great that way too. And I just wanted to show this as an example. Um, I'm here in in McBride today. Um, the the trip planner tool kind of shows two of our main riding areas um, right by McBride. We have Bell Mountain here and Lucille Mountain down here. And if these areas weren't mapped, um, I could choose to go on caltopo.com, which um, shows me slope angles. So here I have uh, Bell Mountain and here I have Lucille. And sorry about these squiggles. That's going to happen. <clears throat> For some reason, PowerPoint just sort of does that. So ignore those. I'm not doing those, but sometimes they happen. And um, yeah, so the great thing about Caltopo is, you know, we can kind of look at our slope angle here on the side and basically 20 degrees, everything that's green, we can kind of roughly translate into simple terrain. Um, the yellow 
is you know getting into challenging and once we get into 40 55 the reds the blues the darker ones you know stuff like this is getting into <clears throat> complex terrain right so it's just another alternative especially if you're heading into an area that isn't mapped um, by avalanche canada um, doesn't have those ace ratings and there's as we know many places like that so um yeah so now Moving on, well, actually, before I move on um, from the basics and, and get into some of our uh, interactive kind of more looking at terrain photos and, and comparing them, um, does anyone have any questions about the basics? I know I just kind of flew through that really quick, but um, are there any questions in the in the chat box there from people or Nancy, do we have anything coming in? Um, no, Martina, nothing at this time. Thanks. Perfect. <laughs> if you guys think of anything as we go through, I'm going to kind of after each problem, after each scenario, um, kind of open it up for questions. So if you guys think of anything later, just type it in there um, and, and we'll address it. So um, yeah, matching terrain to conditions. So as you can see from this photo, I mean, this is an area where, you know, there's many days in the winter where you would feel comfortable uh, playing around in here, and this was obviously not the day for it um, because the conditions weren't right. So um, what does it mean um, when I talk about conditions? Um, it's not working. I'm not able to progress my screen. Hang on. My computer's frozen. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Weird. Okay. Uh, maybe. Uh, the webcam's working great. Um, if you want to yeah. talk there, I think I can bring up your presentation and just show it on my end, and uh, we can uh, fumble through it here a bit. Sure. Or should I just stop sharing for a second, Brent, and try and start it up again? Yeah, you could try. I'll just take the controls. Sorry, folks, just give us a second here. Good old modern technology. Um, I'll just grab the controls and then uh, I'll uh, send it back to you. No, I think it's working on my end again. I don't. Let me try this again. OK. Can't did that did that screen change for you, Brent? Is that working? You're good to go again. Perfect. OK, so we're going to start off um, by just looking at the bulletin. We're going to start with the hazard ratings. OK, um, so the danger ratings, I feel like when we're at the very basic level of our education, sometimes we look at the colors and, and we kind of see traffic lights, right? Red means go or sorry, red means stop. Yellow and orange are kind of slow down and, and green means go. And we kind of want to look a little bit past that into into the actual definition. So um, with high, we're looking at very dangerous avalanche conditions. Um, travel in in avalanche terrain is is not recommended. Um, dangerous conditions uh, exist with considerable careful snowpack evaluation, um, cautious route finding, conservative decision making, all of that. So we're going to kind of go through a bunch of different uh different hazard ratings throughout these scenarios and and apply them to the terrain oh brent i feel like my screen is frozen again don't quite understand why it's doing this uh it's because we're live right yeah bummer here yeah. i'll just uh okay I'm gonna try and go out and back in again yeah, I'll take it back and I'll give it back to you. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Yay! <laughs> Hope it keeps working. Okay. And then next, this is this is really important to when you're looking through the bulletin to go past just just those hazard ratings, just the colors. And, and start looking at the avalanche character um, and the specific problems and where they exist uh, in the terrain. So, um, for example, here we would have a persistent slab problem. 
uh, it's at this uh, kind of shows which elevations. So in this case, it's all, but sometimes it would just be below tree line or just in the alpine. Uh, this shows us our slopes, uh, north, east, west. Um, if, if we can block off a part of that, let's say the hazard only exists on north through west aspects, it means that these slopes, everything that's south through west, would would not have an avalanche problem potentially, unless it was a secondary one or something of that kind. And then there's there's our likelihood. How likely is it that we're going to trigger that avalanche? And if we trigger it, what is that expected size? What size one, size two, size three? How much how much hazard can we expect? So, um, yeah, all of this information from avalanche characters. So. Uh, yeah, basically everything we just went through here. Um, and, and so the whole point of this, uh, of reading this ahead of time, looking at the bulletin, is so when you get out into the terrain, before you get to this point, you and your partner are already going to have a solid idea of probably which line you want to take, right? You're going to know where the hazard exists in the terrain, where your safe options are, um, and, and yeah hopefully have a plan and, and be able to have a good discussion on it. So we're going to go through some interactive terrain exercises here. Uh, and we're going to have a danger rating, avalanche problem, the relevant weather uh, for, for each of those scenarios. And then we're going to decide where we want to go. So problem one, uh, here is our weather. So we've got five centimeters of new snow. Uh, winds are kind of moderate. Uh, it's cloudy, we've got a warming trend, it's not that cold. And we have a wind slab problem, right? So the wind slab problem only exists in the alpine and tree line, and it doesn't exist, oh, sorry about that, on west through south aspects. Uh, its chances are likely size one to two. So let's take a look at our terrain, and I'm just gonna move that over. Um, see how we can apply this. So we don't have a compass here, uh, but I can just tell you and I can tell from, from the wind direction, uh, our prevailing winds generally in BC and Alberta, they come from the Southwest. We're, we're gonna pretend that that's what's going on in this photo and that our, our shady areas here, oh, it's not drawing, there we go. Our shady areas are north through east facing. And those are the ones that are all getting loaded by these winds. So again, sorry about those zigzags, PowerPoint's just doing that. Um, so those are those are our danger zones. And those are the zones that we want to avoid for this day, right? We're in the Alpine, Northeast slopes, we can see maybe some cornices have built up here. And if we're gonna trigger an avalanche, that's where it's gonna be. But look at all of this other riding terrain that we have here, everything else that's out here. Uh, we might want to watch out for this little area. I don't see how big that is, but you know maybe that would actually be be a no-go zone um, if it's if it's big enough that we would be worried about it. But look at everything that's in the foreground. Now in the foreground we are kind of on that northeast aspect, but look at our slope angle, right? We're we're below 30 degrees. Uh, we're we're this is all kind of good terrain to play in with these conditions. So hopefully that's kind of making sense to people, right? We've kind of applied, uh, we've figured out which aspects are, are the, the danger areas, what elevation, and, and where our safe riding is. So let's apply that same problem. So same thing, but to a different photo. Uh, so i um, just going to change my pen color again. So once again, I can I can see the wind effect here. We're gonna say that northeast, the the shady sides in this photo are are hazard areas. So we would want to avoid this area and probably everything in here. Now, what about this zone? Um, this zone is kind of interesting. We've got some light and some shade, and what we've got here is what's called cross loading. So our winds are coming from this direction, right? And they're loading up the, the shady slopes, um, but the technically these sunny slopes might not have those wind slabs, but it's 
I, I would probably not want to risk it, not want to thread that needle, and I would just stay out of of these these upper zones. But um, let me just change that again. This still leaves us all of this other terrain. You know, we can probably play on these slopes down here in these lower paths. We don't want to push it up too high, but there's tons and tons of terrain here that we can play in, right? All of this stuff, this whole sunny slope that's uh, in the foreground is all good to go, right? With these conditions. Now, of course, we still want to do our assessments out in the field and actually verify that we only have one slab problem. But if we're going by, you know, the expectation that the bulletin has set, then um, we can kind of, you know, if everything's if everything's matching up, and, and that's what we're seeing out there is that we just have a wind slab problem, then it's giving us a lot of terrain to play in and just these very limited areas, these red zones to stay out of. Um, yeah. Uh, so before we go to problem two, actually, I'll just go back. Are there any questions so far? Do we, is anyone, am I like super clear here? <laughs> I may have a question from the floor, Martina. Okay. I'm just going to check if Debbie Wood had a question. Um, awesome. I'm going to unmute you, and you can go ahead there, Debbie. Oh, it looks like that was probably an accidental hand up, so it just disappeared. I must be doing such a great job, Brent. <laughs> Seriously, guys, don't be scared to ask questions. Just You don't have to ask them live. You can put them in the chat box, but... I know I'm not doing that good of a job that nobody has questions. So don't be shy, for sure, ask away. OK, so moving on to problem two. Um, so we've kind of stepped up our hazard, right? Uh, in the Alpine, it's basically just telling us that travel and avalanche terrain is not recommended. So we might just want to look at staying out of the Alpine entirely. Uh, you know, there there might be options if we can get to the Alpine and there's there's some super low angle or non avalanche terrain that's high up. Maybe we could play with that. But right off the bat, if I'm making my trip plan and I see high in in one of the elevation bands, I'm gonna want to make a plan to just avoid that zone. Uh, and what did the star weather look like? Uh, so we have 10 centimeters of new snow. We've got a shallow snowpack in the Rockies and consistent strong winds for the last five days it's kind of cold at minus 12 and we have two problems this time so we have wind slabs that are focused on west sorry that are focused on north through east aspects um and kind of coming out of the southwest so you know that would be our safe zone except when i look down at our persistent slab problem it's kind of on all aspects all elevations um so it kind of negates our wind slab problem. We know it's especially, especially dangerous at alpine and treeline on those uh, north through east aspects. But we also, while it might be a bit safer below treeline, there's, there's still quite a bit of hazard, um, especially since we're expecting, you know, there could be avalanches. While unlikely, they're still possible up to size four, right? So let's see how we would apply that to, to this area here. Um, so we're looking at some challenging, you know, verging on complex terrain here in the background. So if we were to go to this area, I feel like right off the bat, um, I would say no to the Alpine and, you know, it's kind of verging on tree line here. I know there's some trees, but I'm going to call it alpine anyway it's it's close enough right um now with the persistent slab problem we also have the potential for remote triggering right uh what does it say here it says avalanches failing on a persistent weak layer buried in mid-february are surprisingly large and wide these could be triggered by a smaller avalanche cornice fall or a person and when we have that type of problem and it exists throughout the terrain, as opposed to just being isolated at the top where our wind slabs are, uh, we have the potential to, to trigger that weak layer, collapse it down in the flats below and have it travel up the slope way above us. So in that case, I want a margin of safety here. So we see these flats down here and I would wanna stay out of this entire zone. 
right? Because even though my slope angle here might be zero degrees or five degrees, it's still within the run out. And I mean, personally, I've accidentally triggered avalanches up to a kilometer away from me. You know, I've skied down into or sledded down into a flat meadow and all of a sudden the whole mountain's coming down from, from super far away. Um, so with these types of conditions, I would want to avoid that. Um, and there's these kind of micro, smaller terrain features, but potentially with some terrain traps, I would also want to avoid those. But uh, change back to green. You know, it looks like there's still quite a bit that that leaves us here to, to play around with, but we'd want to be careful, right? We'd still, there's, there's little who knows what's down in this gully and what's down in this gully. We'd want to kind of tiptoe around because there's still, you know, it's considerable at tree line. And while we're sticking to simple terrain, simple terrain is still avalanche terrain. So um, we'd want to watch out for some of these little zones, but there's still lots of options out there for us. So I'm just going to pop out the next poll um, here and ask you guys, what do you think about how this rider is treating the conditions? Is this, do you think that, you know, he is making the appropriate choices. Is this what you would do with these same conditions that we just talked about? So let's start up that poll and see what you guys think. Okay, lots of stuff starting to come in. So right now we've got about 57% of people are saying no, 30 seven are giving me a depends and um, about six percent or yes we'll let the last few of you get in there see that 60 percent have voted so see what you guys think oh and we accidentally lost the screen we're back in full screen no nope, that okay. was uh, that's like 66 percent of you have voted so what was that, Brent? Uh, you just, your screen disappeared because I got the poll results up there for folks to see, so. I see, right. It's back on now though? Uh, now I'm going. Oh, I see, be good. now I go back. I gotcha. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. So, it looks like our results are in and 5% of you said yes, 52% said no, and 42 did the good old classic avalanche industry response of it depends. Um, and you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and say that all of you are right to some degree uh, because we don't really have the whole picture. We don't have the 365 degree view. And we don't know how big this slope that this rider is on really is, right? Maybe the photographer is on the top of the slope and it's it's only 10 meters long and maybe he's already done a cut from the top to test it out and there's no terrain trap below. So maybe he is making good decisions, but he could, you could also argue no. I mean, maybe there's a slope that uh, looks like this above him, right? And he's at the bottom of it and you know he's in the alpine um he's definitely taking a big risk there if that's the case uh so we could also argue that it depends <laughs> it depends on what steps he's taken before he's gotten to this point and what all the missing pieces of the picture look like right um this is definitely a, a challenging type of challenging piece of terrain to be in with those conditions uh, because we have, I know I'm drawing in green, but picture that it's red, so I don't have to change back. Um, you know, all of this has the potential to be quite hazardous that day. Then if we uh, consider remote triggering, you know, we got to make our boundaries a lot wider. And so that, that really leaves us kind of this area in the foreground. I'm going to just change colors super quick why don't we choose yellow just for fun so that leaves us you know these these zones here as potentially being safe oh just accidentally went to the next one right so yes no depends it's just good to think about you know you, you want to have a lot of decisions a lot of thought 
gone into it before you find yourself in a position like he is in on that day, right? A lot of discussions with your group, all that sort of stuff. So scenario three, uh, we have considerable moderate moderates. Uh, we have a cornice problem and a wind slab problem. Uh, cornices possible, uh, you know, where you see them, they're looming over many slopes, warm temperatures and sun exposure will likely weaken them. Falling chunk could trigger large and deep avalanches on the slope below. And uh, wind slabs are generally lurking below ridge crests or below those cornices. Uh, behind terrain features, cross-loaded gullies like the ones I pointed out earlier in some of the other terrain photos. Um, and if they fail, um, I'm just going to move that. They can they can trigger some very large destructive avalanches, uh, you know, up to up to size three, but you know, in the possible range. So, you know, the size threes are probably in the alpine, but maybe you know, in the in tree line as well. But what I can see from this is below tree line doesn't seem to have an avalanche problem at all. So if we choose to to play around below tree line, that gives us a lot of options, and as well on those. Uh, south kind of through westerly aspect basically our windward aspects right uh, for our forecast there's no new snow we've got some some light to moderate winds it's sunny it's minus five nothing's really jumping out at us there but we're applying it to some pretty pretty interesting terrain here so one of the things that jumps out at me right away um, and probably should jump out to you if you end up in terrain like this, regardless of what the hazards are, is things like this. So these are recent slides, right? We can see those fracture lines. Um, so we can basically look at that and say, okay, well, we verified that those wind slabs, you know, they're exactly where we think they are. They're on those northeast aspects, those shady aspects, there's huge cornices here. There's a lot of zones here that we want to stay out of. And overall, I feel like even though we're at considerable moderate moderate in the Alpine, you know, considerable, this is this is probably not the day for it, especially when we're considering that we can get size three avalanches here, right? So I would say most of this terrain, you know, we don't want to be anywhere in here. We don't want to be anywhere in here. We don't want to be anywhere down in here and you know here here Oop, that one didn't work so really we're we're really closing down our our terrain and what's what's possible and you know we might be left with with this we've got some smaller terrain features here but with with the terrain traps below I mean, even if you're trying to thread your way through here, there's a lot of micro features. You'd be threading the needle. You wouldn't want to go through here unless, I don't know, you were a very experienced group and you were willing to take some bigger risks and kind of tiptoe your way through, gather information as you go. But what you can't see in this photo is everything that's facing the other direction, <laughs> which <laughs> might be, you know, super, yeah, it might be all of your all of your west your south facing stuff. There's no cornices, maybe no wind slabs. Um, so yeah, I, I would probably probably try and find a different zone with these conditions to, to work through. So same problem, different slope. And here I kind of see this slope initially, which I guess it's worth having a quick discussion on um, you know what we mean by tree line, what we mean by alpine. And even though there's trees here, I would definitely think of this as a sort of an alpine feature. It's a large, large feature. You know, you could you could get quite a large avalanche here that would funnel you into a terrain trap. Um, so I wouldn't be treating this necessarily as moderate if I if I believed that the, the wind slabs were there, even though there's no cornice over top, right? Um, so this is looking like, aside from this, a uh, little feature here. Um, we've got a lot of terrain that we can work with. Unlike the previous photo, there's quite a bit here that we can play with, right? 
these slope angles are, are quite low. You know, they're, they're looking like they're mostly below 30 degrees. Um, there's lots of fun stuff that I see to play around in here. The one thing that I would be super careful of that can catch people is we don't see any cornices, right? There's no cornices here. We're, we're probably on, on, on those kind of west, or we're on the windward aspect. But that means that all of the cornices are probably here on this ridge top. So where you see these tracks coming up, unless you're super familiar with this spot, you know, if it's your first time up here, I would be super leery of, of just charging straight up to ridge line because those cornices can take us you know, by surprise, we get up there, we don't know that they're there, and all of a sudden we've broken through, we've triggered an avalanche, or gone off the cliff. So be super leery as you, um, or I always am anyway, I'm super leery as I approach ridge lines that I'm not familiar with. I might, you know, park my sled a little bit earlier, I might get out my probe and just make sure I can still probe the ground. And, you know, in general, I just try and give them a wide berth. You know, they can break far back and it's just not worth it especially on a day when we have a known, you know, a known cornice problem and we know that they're tender and ready to break. So, yeah. And just as a, a final, final piece of terrain with the same problem, you know, I think that this would probably be one of, one of the best places to go with a problem like this. Uh, it's all sort of below tree line and tree line. The one place I might be leery of, Feel like I can't tell. I would, I would probably want to take, you know, get into here and get my inclinometer out and see how steep this stuff is. This could be verging on 30 degrees or steeper. There might be some some wind slabs formed in there, but there's no overhead hazard, unlike unlike this big area up here, um, which I should be actually drawing in red. This is definitely not a zone that you'd want to be in. I mean, it doesn't look like fun riding in there anyway, necessarily, but. Um, yeah, I would, I would probably work my way into this terrain, and if I didn't, if I didn't find any wind slabs here, if it was the right, the right aspect, um, I, th this would probably be one of the best terrain choices for these types of problems. So, um, before we head on to the next scenario, are there any questions yet about anything I've said so far? Hey, Martina, um, Ben just has a question for cornice avalanche problem types in the bulletin. Can you distinguish that problem type from other avalanche problem types that can be cornice triggered? Right, that's a good point, um, Ben. I think if, whenever you're in <laughs> avalanche terrain that has cornices looming above you, I mean, if they're big, I just, I never personally quite trust them. So I, Cornices, if, if they're in, to, in my terrain that day, I, I always kind of keep them in the back of my mind. I'm always kind of thinking about them, and I don't like to hang out underneath them. But the times when we actually include, when the forecasters include cornices as a problem is when we know that, or we don't know, but we're, we're forecasting, we're anticipating that there's going to be large cornices that just in themselves could create uh, an avalanche that's size two, like they just have enough mass, and we feel like it, they're going to be failing. So we either have some warm, some super warm temperatures that are going to add extra load, or maybe we have um, winds, some strong winds that are forecast that are going to be loading them. So the times when they're kind of stepped up to be a problem, right? Um, when they can create larger avalanches. Uh, so. I kind of like to compare it in a way to, to a loose, dry avalanche problem. You know, in certain terrain features, when it's steep enough, and a loose, dry is always a problem, but there's some, some times uh, when, when we have a whole bunch of new storm snow, it's super low density, or it's sitting on top of a slippery crust, where it can just really entrain and push a whole bunch more. So those are the times when we would say loose, dry is a problem. You know, once it's more than, than usual. So hopefully that, that answers your question, Ben. Do we have any other questions, Nancy? No, that's it for now. Thanks, Martina. Okay. Hey, Martina, I got a couple yes. hands up here. They've been up for about 10 minutes or so. Perfect. One is yep. Brian Rennie, and I'm just wondering if, Brian, did you have a question? You can go ahead and talk away if you like. Yeah. Hey, Martina, um, thanks for doing this. I uh, You mentioned a few times, um, 
size one, two, three, and I think you mentioned a four. Just could you quantify what a one, two, three, and four is, please? Yes. <laughs> now I wish I had the actual definitions in front of me. But um, uh, so the the size, the avalanche size scale uh, is an exponential scale. So you know, a size one is kind of up to you know like a ton of snow like it's it's not enough to bury fully bury or kill somebody but in the right piece of terrain you know if, if there was a train trap or if you were over a cliff it could still be harmful because it could sweep you off your feet so they still have a bit of mass but it's not enough to generally fully bury somebody right so it's kind of like a small cup bank that sort of thing let's say 10 meters by 10 meters right and then a size two would be exponential to that so it would be big enough to bury or kill somebody. Um, and so basically at size two, we're already at a large avalanche. We're already worried, right? Um, then at size three, again, exponential to a size two, we're talking about wiping out, you know, we could we could take out a train, we could take out, you know, a building, that sort of stuff. Um, and now off the top of my mind, I can't remember exactly how many hectares of forest or whatever would be destroyed. If you guys are super curious, you can just Google it really quick. <laughs> um, but size three, super, I mean, we can maybe, lots of people have survived size two avalanches, but a size three, pretty hard to survive. You're looking at lots and lots of debris. You could be buried meters and meters deep, even if there isn't a train trap. And again, size four, exponential to that. Um, and then size five, you're talking the, the largest avalanche known to humankind that usually involves, you know, ice, a glacier. It's usually triggered by an earthquake or something like that. And it's going to take out, you know, an entire town and that sort of thing. They don't, they don't happen very often, but certainly scary when they do. So hopefully, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's good context. Thank you very much. And Brent, you said there was another hand up? Yeah, I got another hands up here from Ryan Sukaroff. If you wanna go ahead and ask your question there, Ryan. Could have been an accidental hand up. That's no problem. Yeah, looks like it was. Okay. That's about well, all we got. And just question. for people, yeah, just for people's knowledge, uh, we did post a link to our online tutorial with the avalanche size and impact pressures and everything in there. You can get in the chat box. Hey, Martina, there's a couple questions that came in. Um, from Serge, is there a preferred angle to approach a slope? Is up and down better or side to side? Great question. Um, so preferred angle for me when I'm approaching slopes, especially if I'm just at the early part of my day, maybe I'm in a new zone, I want to start small and, and work my way up. I want to gather information as I go, right? Uh, so, you know, I'm going to want to stay maybe in just non-avalanche terrain until I've, I've gathered more information, until I've seen some avalanche terrain, seen if there's signs of, of recent avalanches, that sort of thing. So I want to start below that 30 degrees, unless the caveat to that is maybe I see a little test slope, right? Maybe there's a cut bank on the way in that's like seven meters tall or something like that. And I want to pop in and cut that with my sled just get in and side hill it and see if I can trigger that. And in that case, I want it to be steep. I want to hit it on the convexity at the most likely trigger points. Um, and I can come in from the top or I can side hill across, but I want to make sure that it's it's the type of slope that if I trigger it, I'm not, it doesn't have any consequences other than getting my sled stuck maybe. You know, I'm not going to get swept into a tree or, or get, you know, buried in a little creek, but I can do a little test and that sort of thing. So. For me, that's preferable, right? Just trying to, you know, start out small, work my way up. And then, you know, if you've gathered information throughout your day, now you've decided to put yourself onto a big slope, you're feeling confident, um, and, and you've worked your way up, you're like, okay, now I'm on a 30 degree slope. Um, to answer your question about whether I want to cut across or go in from the top, for me, I personally, Again, I'm still going to want to gather information if it's if I'm if I'm the first one dropping in onto this slope. I like to go in from the top first, maybe the top and cut across and and test any convexity because snow that is below you can't bury you, 
right? Snow above you can't. So if you're going from the bottom, if we're doing a hill climb and we're turning on the convexity, you know, if there's any chance for, for remote triggering or a slab, a weak layer propagating above you, then all of that snow that's above you will come down and bury you. So I like starting from the top and working my way down. And once we've gained confidence, you know, we can start, you know, playing around and, and doing whatever. Um, it's not always possible to do that, right? We don't always get the chance to um, climb, find a mellow way to the top and drop down on the steep stuff. Sometimes we just have to go up on the steep stuff. And when that's the case, I, wa I want to be sure I've gathered enough information. I'm not just entering a bowl and heading straight into climbing that hill and doing a big pull to the ridge top. I want to work my way into it. Um, Thanks, Martina. There's question? another one um, from Austin. What okay. would you say the percentile would be of surviving a size three avalanche, even with a properly deployed airbag? Oh, I'm going to give that typical answer. Of, it depends. Um, in general, I want to say, I mean, I wouldn't know exact statistics. I'm sure somebody, you could probably gather statistics on that if you you know, looked at worldwide avalanches. Um, the difficulty with that is we don't have as many statistics for the people that survived. We have a lot of statistics for the people that died. I mean, ballpark, non-scientific, I'm, I'm going to say it's, it's quite low. Like, I, I don't, I, you don't have too much of a chance of surviving. I mean, less than 70% probably chance, like maybe a 30% chance of survival. I'm not sure, but you know, it's, it's not looking good. You're, you're looking at a, a really big avalanche. And when I say it depends, you know, even with that airbag, airbags are most useful when they're, if you come into the top, from the top of a slope and you've deployed it, you know, let's say you've triggered it on that convexity, you're on top, the airbag lets you float as you're going down the mountainside. But if you come up from the bottom and it, you've remote triggered something on top of you, you're not floating anywhere. It, it doesn't matter if you have that airbag or, or not, chances are it's all just gonna come down on top of you. Same thing if there's a terrain trap below you, that airbag isn't gonna be much use. Um, and yeah, I mean, airbags, studies have shown that in, in BC, you know, in, in Europe, in, in places where, where there's where there aren't trees, people are less likely to die of trauma in avalanches. Um, people have kind of a higher success rate of, of surviving avalanches using airbags. But, you know, in in BC, the, the statistics kind of show that they have, airbags improve your chances of survival by about 10 to 15 percent. So it's it's a little bit like that, like maybe doing up a seatbelt, but a weak one in the car. It's not going to prevent your accident. It's not necessarily going to save your life. A lot of people die in car crashes wearing seatbelts, but it's just one more tool to help you. So hopefully that that answers question. I might have digressed a bit there on on airbags, but um, yeah, basically you 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 don't that airbag is 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 not going to necessarily. I wouldn't count on it to save my life um on, on in a size two or, or or greater avalanche at all so yeah hey thanks Martina. Uh, can i give you one more question um sure this this is from chelsea we have a group coming from ontario what would be your suggestions for first-time backcountry riders who are learning avalanche terrain well i think that i mean for me personally i I wouldn't really want to head out into avalanche terrain unless, with no training, unless I had a guide or unless I'd taken a, an AST course. Um, you know, if you're if you're heading out into avalanche terrain, you want to have the right gear. You don't want to be going out without a transceiver, a probe, and a shovel. Um, and and just you know, even that basic knowledge that you would gain from an AST one course. So. But there's, there's lots of, I'm not saying don't go riding. There's, like I said, I have a ton of fun just playing even in non-avalanche terrain. You know, there's, there's mellow cut blocks out there. There's, there's different places that you can go or you can hire a guide to, to take you. But I wouldn't necessarily take that, that risk of 
I just, I don't like exposing myself to, to risk that I'm not even aware of. You know, it's one thing to, you know, do my assessments and, and say, okay, well, this has a, I have a 50, 50% chance of dying and I'm going to go for it because I really want to ride this line. And there's, you know, that's my choice, right? I've, I've at least made an informed, I, I'm not taking a risk without knowing it, but if you're going into avalanche terrain for the first time and, you know, even if you have the right gear, it's not necessarily going to save you. You really, the, the, the best way to, to, you know, prevent an accident is that knowledge. So I'd really recommend taking a course or, or having someone knowledgeable with you before you go. All right, Nancy, I think I'm going to move to the next one. But if you guys have more questions after the next scenario, then feel free to throw them in there. We've, oh, my goodness. OK, I'm going to run through stuff pretty quickly here. <laughs> we just answered a whole bunch of questions. We're at 8 o'clock, so hopefully no one has anywhere to go. But um, yeah, so our next problem, we're going to look at what happens when it's, you know, all hell is breaking loose. Oops, this is, this is a pretty bad forecast, right? So a lot of people might just decide to stay at home. Um, and that's kind of what we're recommending here, right? Don't don't go if it's high and even below tree line, it's gonna be, it's considerable. Um, there's a lot of a lot of people die at considerable, right? Those are difficult conditions. The the weather forecast here is not looking great. You know, it's it's decreasing uh, or hazard is increasing throughout the day. We have another 15, 20 centimeters of snow, strong winds that are gonna increase that loading and um, yeah we've got some pretty bad problems so we have a persistent weak layer that you know so we have that remote triggering that's a potential we have storm slabs and it's all elevations all aspects so let's look at somewhere like here uh, so this is this is the Renshaw area um, and I see a lot of non avalanche terrain here right a lot of stuff that's below 30 degrees you know um, You've got all of this stuff in the foreground that looks great. I see some great options for some jumps here, all sorts of fun stuff to play around on, <laughs> like cool things that you can do. Um, and then there's all these meadows here. You know, I don't, you know, you can start peeping out into this stuff. I can't quite tell from looking from far away how steep these little pockets are. So you know, I wouldn't just rip over there, but if, if these are, you know, 15 degree slopes, how about her, right? As long as, as you're looking up on a day like this, right? You, you want to consider how far stuff can run. And, and something that people, I find that I, that I meet out in the backcountry often don't consider is they might be really familiar with, with a piece of terrain, like maybe they've ridden Renshaw 40, 50 times, and they have this piece of terrain in mind. They're like, great, it's high. We're going to stick to to this open meadow here. We're going to hit our favorite jumps. We're going to practice our re-entries, whatever it is, right? But what they forget about is the access trail on the way in, right? They're on a groomer. They're not thinking about it. And, you know, that the access to Renshaw has uh, the runouts of four or five giant avalanche paths that can hit the grooming, right? So while you're not going to be the one to trigger it, you could get unlucky and get taken out by a natural avalanche. You know, 95, 90, 95% of avalanches are triggered by the victim or somebody in that in the victim's party, but there's still that 5% chance. Um, and it does happen. People do get taken out by, by natural avalanches. And on a day like this, it's likely, right? We can see... Um, it's it's very likely that those storm slabs are going to happen and they, they might trigger persistent slabs down lower. So if you are thinking about going into a piece of terrain that you're familiar with, you feel safe there, you know that it's not avalanche terrain, there's no overhead hazard, just remember to think about your access as well. Um, so this is another piece. Um, we've got these two sledders here. And I think the other important thing to remember you are threading the needle, so while we can give ourselves a buffer here and say this, this is going to be our zone for the day, you know, this is what we're going to be riding um, in this area, and we're going to stay away from, from all, the, all the big terrain and all the possible runouts, this will get tracked out pretty quick if you have a big group. 
So if I'm going out on a high hazard day, I want a small group. I want experienced people. This is not the day to bring out a newbie. Um, you want to have good communication, not rely just on radios, like shut off, like helmets off, have a conversation and figure out your boundaries for that day. Um, because you are, you are taking a pretty big risk as soon as you start to push out of those boundaries. Okay, I'm gonna try to get through a few more of these problems and then leave some questions for the end. So our next problem, we have loose, wet, and wet slabs. And it looks like with our, our weather forecast, um, it's gonna get quite warm. We didn't have a good overnight breeze. It was minus one. But according to, to our forecast here, you know, above 1200 meters should develop a crust, but it'll probably deteriorate, sorry, during the heat of the day, um, especially during periods of, of daytime warming or, or rain. Uh, but, you know, in our forecast, there's no rain, so it's something we'd want to think about if it does start to rain all out there. But, you know, it sounds like warming is going to be our major problem. So, What's interesting here with this is if we look at our, I'm just going to change pen colors super quick, right? Normally we would look at this piece of shady terrain and say, oh my God, okay, that's our, that's our wind loaded stuff. Our cornices are there. Um, this is our scariest piece of terrain. We would want to avoid that. But with these types of problems, the shady stuff, it's actually keeping it cool, right? So First thing in the morning, this might, you know, even if these are your north facing slopes, this might be one of your safest uh, avalanche terrain areas. I mean, of course, you have all this stuff in the foreground that might be non avalanche terrain, but, you know, even something like this piece here, which, you know, might look benign, it's just, just at probably 30 degrees, you might feel like it's much safer than, you know, dropping this. It might not be, this might be exactly where you're going to trigger that avalanche that day with this type of problem, right? So even though it's saying all aspects, all elevations, when you're out there, you need to verify, right? If you're finding that the shady slopes are still crusty, um, they're, still, they're still pretty solid, but you're getting the, the sunny aspects are mushy, you step off your sled, you just go like right to your waist, you know, you know there's no cohesion in that snow. Um, it, it's kind of counterintuitive, but in this case, your, your more complex but shady areas are going to be safer than uh, maybe your mellower, generally normal, normally safer zones are actually going to be um, where the hazard is the greatest. Um, and, and so same problem here, but, you know, looking at this, looking at the snow, you can tell it's not it's not crusty, it's not wet, right? Wet snow looks different. This is still dry powder snow in this track here. Um, so, and you can tell they're going up the shady side of the mountain, they're just on a bit of a ridge here. Um, and this side is, is probably north facing, it's still got the dry snow, but this side is getting pounded by the sun. So again, even though our, our problem says, uh, you know, uh, all aspects, you know, up high in, in the alpine here and on the north aspect, we're actually finding dry snow. So this might be safe while this side um, might be getting pounded by the sun and, and we would want to stay off that. So sometimes our shady aspects are safer, sometimes they're not. It depends on our problem and the conditions and what we've verified as we've been out there during that day. And I'm going to run one last poll just for fun. What do you guys think about this person here? Are they making a good choice for the conditions with this type of problem? So we have loose, wet, wet slab problem. Um, see what you guys think. One last poll, see if you guys are still awake. Getting some votes in. Looks like people are leaning heavily towards no. Not that I want to sway anyone. We've got um, still some votes coming in out of 60%, like 14% saying yes, and 25% kind of waffling on the depends. All 
All right. Well, that looks like um, well, there's still a few coming in, but yeah, out of the votes, looks like 60% said no, 25% said depends, and 15% um, went to yes. So I'm just going to go back. Brent, am I, are we back on my screen? Out of the poll screen? Yeah, you're looking good. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, you know, I would be inclined to agree here um, that, that, yeah, the answer probably is no, but you could also get away with yes and depends. You guys are learning that I, I, I kind of waffle <laughs> as well. Um, you know, it's not a great place to be. Obviously, it's kind of been raining maybe in this photo. Everything's wet. You can tell that the snow is a little bit damp. There's tons of overhead hazard here. You know, and this person's really pushing the margin. Um, you know, and, and so here if we read this, wet slab avalanches are expected during periods of daytime warming and during periods of rain showers. Um, and and we don't, it doesn't really tell us, we'd have to go into the further details of the bulletins to find out what weak layer is there, but possibly the, that wet slab is, is on a persistent layer. Maybe we're worried about remote triggering. And this is a pretty exposed spot to be even though we can see, you know, the angle here, I mean, that's that's less than 30, but wet slabs and, and loose wet avalanches can travel a really long ways. Um, and they're, they're not very survivable. You know, that snow is so dense and so heavy. It sets up like concrete. Um, it, it's about as easy to swim in as wet concrete uh, if you're caught in it. So, um, yeah, this person is definitely, definitely pushing their luck. And one thing to consider is, you know, what if they get stuck there? You know, maybe they're thinking they're fine on this low angle stuff to just zip through really quickly. But now if they get stuck there, they might be exposed for a longer period of time. And if that's your partner, you might ne not necessarily want to go up there and help them at that time because now both of you would be exposed, right? So with these conditions, I would say that this probably wouldn't be my, my first choice of of places to go um, with these types of with these types of problems, especially if it's actually raining, like it looks like it is. Um, maybe I'm, Nancy, I'm just going to run through the rest of the the problems really quick, and then we'll do the questions at the end. So green means go, right? <laughs> so low doesn't mean no avalanches, um, but it does mean that you know it's. It's about, it might be about as good as, it, as you're gonna get. So this is when you wanna hit up some of your bigger objectives. You know, if you've been playing in simple terrain for the whole season, and now you wanna get out and do some hill climbing, or maybe you wanna, you know, jump off some cornices. I don't know what it is. This might be the day for it, right? So we've got two centimeters of new snow, light winds, it's cloudy, it's nice and cold. And there's some wind slabs. Forecaster is kind of saying that they could be anywhere, but they're old and tired. They're more likely to be triggered right, right in lee locations of, of ridge tops. You're gonna have to get out there and see what it looks like. Um, so in this case, I would really just be worried about maybe, maybe the very, the very ridge tops. But for the most part, you know, this type of terrain, which with a persistent problem or a storm slab problem or almost any other, you know, more serious problem you would want to stay out of um, with all the terrain traps and different features, this would be the, these would be the conditions for it. This would be a great day to go out and like hit up whatever you like. Um, similar with, with this photo, right? So here I can see where the cornices are and where the most likely spots are to trigger those wind slabs. Are kind of right, right along the ridge top. So I might want to do some investigating before I go in. Sorry about those squiggles. So the way I might approach this, you know, if, if say I really, um, I'm just going to erase that quickly. If I really want to ride this line here, because um, it's let's face it, it's a pretty cool line. Sorry about the squiggle. I the best way to approach it, if I want to, you know, I've done some tests along the way, I might want to come up, go up this way where it's mellower and drop in from the top, right? And, and that way, again, like I said before, snow that's below you, 
isn't going to bury you. It's the snow above you. So at least if you are going to trigger something small, you know, we're thinking small size ones, you know, we've got, we might not want to be lined up with any terrain traps, but it's below us, you know, we're approaching it the right way. And for the most part, these are the conditions where you want to, where you want to hit it up, like go, go everywhere, <laughs> go wild. And just as a final thing, um, spring's a long time away, but, uh, you know, around end of April, May, uh, we stop putting out forecasts and you kind of get, you kind of get this, it says spring conditions and we have no ratings. So we don't have our colors anymore. Um, we really have to become our own forecasters. And generally in the spring, this becomes easier because we're dealing with what's called spring diurnal cycles. So during the day it warms up and you get a period of, you know, considerable, maybe even high hazard if it's like really, really warm or if it's raining. And then during the day it might freeze, we get a crust and, you know, in the middle of the night you couldn't buy an avalanche. And then, you know, it can, the hazard might slowly increase during the day and change hour by hour, but you really have to be out there judging it for yourself. So with these conditions, we know that it's rising to plus eight, but it's had a good overnight freeze. So we can expect it to be pretty good for the morning. Um, and then, you know, as we're starting to warm up during the day, maybe we even want to bring a thermometer with us, but we can usually feel when it's getting pretty warm. We would want to approach the same piece of terrain where, you know, we were there, let's say a month ago, it was three times low and we were riding everything. This kind of stuff, we might want to, it's, we're our own forecasters, right? So if this has been baking in the sun all day and this has been shady and we don't feel like there's a wind slab problem, maybe we want to play in the shade um, and leave the sunny stuff alone. Or maybe if this has just come into the sun, well, Maybe it's going to be good for, for an hour, and then after that hour, we're going to want to get off of it, right? Maybe uh, you get up there, and there's 20 centimeters of fresh snow, and you're like, okay, we have a storm slack problem. So really, during those spring conditions, um, you know, you, generally, it, it's easy to forecast for when it's warm, when it's hot, it's dangerous, when it's frozen, it's not, but there are exceptions and, and yeah, you just have to be your own forecaster. So um, thanks everybody. Uh, hopefully that helped some of you. Um, I know that was a lot of information and talking being thrown at you, but uh, yeah, hopefully that helps. And if there's any more questions, um, let's have them. Happy to answer them. Martina, Martina, I don't currently have any um, in the chat box. Maybe maybe Brent does. Yeah, I got a hands up from Brian Rennie again there. Brian, do you have another question? Um, sorry, yeah, my hand was up for uh, some slides that were considerably further back about, you know, uh, I think it was a slide that you had that showed um, extreme, extreme and considerable at the bottom. Um, right. And you know the geographic areas that where the ratings come from are so big and broad that it's hard to know the specific conditions of actually where you're riding. Yes. And, and so instead of just relying solely on whatever Avalanche Canada puts out to the best of its ability, uh, the local conditions in that spot at that moment could be different than what the rating is. And um, perhaps Martina, you know, maybe you can comment on the importance of doing your own snow science and digging a pit and checking for compression results. Right, for sure. So, I mean, take the, the area that, that I, I work in as an avalanche technician, right? We have the North Rockies. It's 40,000 square kilometers. And, you know, very often, I mean, I can think of a number of times last winter where up in Pine Pass by Mackenzie and Chutman there, you know, it was, the world was coming down, um, giant avalanches everywhere. And here in McBride, you know, you felt like you couldn't buy an avalanche in Renshaw. So yes, there are some difficulties. You know, if we, you look at Switzerland and they have 140 different forecast zones for one of our bulletin areas that's the size of, you know, the North Rockies. Um, so it, 
It definitely, I, I totally agree with you that the more knowledge you have and the more you can gather out there, you know, if you're, the bulletin kind of helps you set an expectation for the day. So, um, you know, if you see what the bulletin is saying um, and it's, it's saying, okay, well, there's storm slabs that are, you know, there's 40 centimeters of fresh snow and it's on all of these, you know, it's on all aspects and there's forecast winds throughout the day. Um, you might want to choose the appropriate area just in case, but let's say you, you go up to an area and you're not seeing that. You're not seeing 40 centimeters of fresh snow, you're seeing five, and you're not seeing any signs of natural avalanches. You're not seeing, um, you're, you're maybe starting to work on some, some micro features, you're hitting some cut banks on the road in, nothing is going. Um, maybe you dig a profile, I mean, I, I don't always, I don't like to encourage people to dig profiles that much because you're looking at point data from one spot. There's so much other information that we can gather, um, especially sledding. Like we're covering so much terrain in one day that digging a pit in one little spot might, it, it may not be the best, the best solution to, you know, that decision of go or no go. For sure, if you've gathered a whole bunch of information, you really want to hit this one spot, this one hill, um, maybe that's the last thing that you do before you jump in, you dig a quick profile and, and you do some tests and, and base your decision on that. But um, for the most part, I would, I would be hesitant to approach big complex terrain if the ratings are high, high considerable, you know? I, I would need a lot of convincing. I would need to see that those problems don't necessarily exist. Um, so does that kind of answer your, your, your question or does that make sense? Yeah, um, that, there... that, that's good input. Um, I think, yeah, all those things from data, all the different data points, you know, from running your own cut to how your group travels through the area, who goes in, one goes in, all goes in, you know, all those things are important. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that thank you very much. And and you know, if you're not at that level yet, as I know some of the people that are joining us today, or you know, they don't some have an AST one, some don't, some have maybe attended a seminar or two. And so, you know, we, we work our way up to that level. Um you're if you're at an AST one level, you, you probably won't be getting to the level of being able to discern that uh, you know, making those exceptions. To, to the bulletin and, and, and choosing to go into challenging or complex terrain until, you know, you've, you've taken an AST2 maybe and then had a few more years and ridden in different areas and, and seen a bunch of different winters with different avalanche problems, right? And it's sometimes as sledders, we, we feel like we correlate to, to riding ability. If you're, if you're a really good rider, then, then you know, you, you might be, you're really good at deciding um, whether avalanche train is safe, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it's just it's sometimes it's the person that has you know the AST two, and and that person might not be the best rider. Um, but um, yeah, just <laughs> not necessarily equating riding ability with um, your avalanche skills. So uh, yeah, I always recommend people get as much education as they can and be curious. You know, look around, ask questions. Um, yeah, that sort of stuff. Are there, Thank you. are there any other questions out there? Yeah, I got another question from the floor from uh, Ken Shukin. Go ahead, Ken. Hey, Ken, you're muted there. Did you have a question still? Yeah, it looks like that might have been a false hand up for you there, Martina. Looks like uh, I got no more questions from the floor. Okay, and Nancy, do you have anyone in the chat or are we? All good here, Martina, thanks. Awesome, okay, well, thanks everybody. Um, yeah, it was it was great to be able to give this presentation. Um, hopefully that was useful for everybody regardless of what level of training they were at. And um, yeah, hope you guys join again next week. Brent, back to you. Awesome. All right.
Thanks everybody for uh, attending tonight. We appreciate your interest in avalanche safety. You can support essential avalanche programs like these by donating as little as 10 bucks to Avalanche Canada. Just click on the link in the question chat box we posted in there and you guys can donate how much you want or uh, nothing at all. Our next webinar specifically for snowmobilers is gonna be Thursday, January 14th. Being pro, using the daily process for sledders. Once again, if you do attend these, uh, pre-registration is required. So uh, tell your friends and we hope you enjoyed the evening and thanks you all for coming out. For groups of people like that,